Hi there, my name's Vince from MyMakeVince.com and in this video today we're going to be trying to fix this gas-fired boiler here. So the problem with it is it's not firing up. So it was working fine and now it's not. Now we've already had a gas safe engineer look at this and he's proved the fault onto the circuit board. Now you can just replace the circuit board, you can get them for a little over £100 or it looks like you can get reconditioned ones on eBay for around about the £50 mark. But looking on Google, it looks like a lot of people are saying that it's a fault of some capacitors. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to show you the boiler not working and then we're going to take the board out. We're going to see, we're going to take out those capacitors, test them and then if they're faulty, replace them. And then, if they are faulty, then hopefully it will work. So we'll get the gas safe engineer to put the board back in, do all the testing, and if we're lucky, it might be working all again for a relatively cheap fix. So I'm at my brother's house at the moment, so he's going to be giving me a, a hand with this. It's Paul's house. So, uh, yeah, let me just fire up this boiler now and show you the problem with it. Right, OK, so we're ready to turn this on now. So we've got power going into it. We've got the core for heat on, so in other words, we've turned the room thermostat on. Now all we have to do is turn it on here, and we will hear that the fan will kick in. So listen to this. That's the fan going now. Right, and now normally what would happen here is you hear like a, a kind of where, where it ignites. So this, hat, there you go, so I'm just gonna be quiet for a minute just so you can hear it kick in and out. There we go. So I'll let my brother explain what happens here. So this one hasn't got a pilot light that's on all the time, has it? No, the, the, uh, because that wastes gas. So the pilot is generated electronically every time. So it's now supposed to be trying to turn the pilot light on. It's not succeeding. You can see there's no pilot coming on. And then that pilot then ignites the gas in the main burner. Right, okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna turn this off and then we're gonna take it apart and start working on it. Right, so we're up in the airing cupboard now where the rest of the components that you need for this central heat and the hot water system is located. So if you have a look here, here is a switch. So we're just gonna turn that off. And uh, did you say it's a double pole? It's double pole switch, so it turns off the live and the neutral at the same time, so it kills all the supply to the whole central heating system. Right, there we go. So now the boiler should be safe to work on, but just to be sure, we are gonna just use a multimeter or something to measure voltage going into it. Now while we're here, we might as well have a quick look because it might be of interest to some people. So this here is your hot water tank that stores all the hot water, is that right? That's right, it's got a backup electric immersion which is on at the moment because the boiler's packed up. Okay. Um, just for the hot water in the event that the boiler packs up. Fine, it's just so a backup system. It's just like a massive kettle in a way, this is a huge element that goes yeah. down into here That's and it. heats up the water. That's there. it, but because it's only for backup, it doesn't go all the way to the bottom, so it only really heats up about a third of the tank at a time. Sure, you can get different sizes. Not for backup, no. You can if you've got an electric heating system, yes, but not uh, for backup, no. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Right. You can get different sizes, but they all generally only tend to heat the top half to a third of the tank. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, because they go at an angle and hit the sides. Sure. Now, this is a pump, so if you had a combi boiler, that would be included in the boiler. It would be, yes. But because this is not a combi boiler, this is a separate pump, which makes it easier to change it's, over. It's what we call, in the UK, we call this a conventional system. Right, okay. Now this one here is, is this a three-way valve? It's a three-port motorised valve. And so the, wa the hot water comes from the boiler, yep. comes through the pump, it's pumped by the pump, yep. and then it goes, it, this valve either splits it to the hot water circuit within the hot water cylinder or to the central heating, or both. Yeah. Now, in this central, in this cylinder here, there's like a big coil. Yeah, it runs from here to here. Yeah. So basically, there's a pipe that coil yeah. is like a coil, like a big spring that's in a way it, yes. that goes around to this one here. Yes. So that's the water that's hot, which in turn then ends up heating the water in the tank. That yes, which is but, the water that you bathe in. Yeah, but you don't need that water for the central heating. That's purely washing your face, having a shower, etc. These, this is the pipes here that run yeah, around the, into your central heating. This water here is the same water as runs through the central heating. Yeah, so that's dirty water. That's basically. dirty water. So if you have a bath and the water starts coming out black and dirty, yeah. it generally means that the coil in here is gone. Fine. Punctured, corroded, uh, through, corroded or whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so yeah. that's one of the telltale signs. Yeah, okay. This is just a old-fashioned thermostat? It's a cylinder thermostat. It's an old one, but it's still good. Yeah. Um, it just measures the te water in the, in the uh, temperature of the water within the hot water cylinder. So when it gets hot enough, it, it, cuts, it cuts off the supply via the, uh, the, the, the three-port motorized valve. Right, okay. This is your own 
sort of uh, valve that you have to release pressure every now and then is that's it? just it's just an air bleed it's just a manual air bleed valve the automatic ones have a tendency to leak right okay now up here what else we got hold on so coming up here now and you've got a big expansion that's because i don't have a tank a lot of people have a feed and expansion tank up in the loft i've removed that because i needed the space so this this does the same thing so now all the, the water in the primary side which is the water that goes around your central heating and through here is pressurized to one bar Oh, hold on one second, so you haven't got a header tank in the attic? No, not anymore. It's been removed and replaced with this scubbins here. Oh, and the reason it's pressurised is because you're not relying on gravity? We're not relying on gravity, no. It's, oh, it's, a, it's, right. it's, okay. it's just pre it's pressurised. So to know relatively low pressure, about one bar. One bar. And then okay. it, it, there's a pressure relief valve here, so if it, gets to, if it gets to up to three bars, you can see there where the red line is, the pressure relief valve will operate and throw the, it, throw it outside. And oh, this, so, oh this, so I see. So you've got a pipe there. You can't see because it's dark, but the pipe goes through the wall. It goes through the wall to the outside. outside. I understand. And yeah. this is the filling loop here, which yeah. is at the moment it's just a, a simple valve turned off. So when the pressure, if the pressure does drop, when you bleed the radiators, for example, the pressure will drop yeah. as you get air or hydrogen in your radiators. It drops, so you can um, just let a bit more pressure into the system here. More water. More water. Is, or if you have minute leaks in the system, yeah. if you've got a big leak, you need to sort it. But if you've got a minute leak, um, like a bit of bleeding somewhere, yeah. weeping, sorry then um, you just, every now and again, you might lose the pressure. You can just up, up the pressure to about one bar when it's cold. Then when it's all warm and stuff, it'll go between one and a half to two bars. Sure. So if you have an aloft conversion like you've had, then you need the space in your attic, so you take away the big black tank. That's it. And then you can put this one lower down instead. But does that still have to be above this? It doesn't, does it? It can be anywhere. No, it could be anywhere now. It's it could just, be downstairs. It's just there for convenience. Yeah, yes. Sure. Well, okay, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a, a long-winded way of turning that switch off. So let's uh, now <laughs> oh, go about the programmer. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. And that's the uh, programmer there. Mm -hmm. And with this one, you can set weekends, weekdays, that sort of thing. All that. But I, I tend to do that on a programmable room stat, which is downstairs. So that's kind of become redundant. So that's just permanently set on now. Sure. But in my house, I've just got a simple yeah. room stat. So I do use the programmer. Yes. But you kind of have this on all the time and let the room stat do all the work? Yes. No? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Let's uh, now double check that we haven't got any voltage going into the boiler. And then we can take that circuit board out and test those capacitors. Just explain how you're checking this. Okay, well this is the cable that's coming in here at the back. It's this grey, grey twin and earth cable here. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. so these are the ones that are feeding it. There's a live, a neutral, and there's an earth cable here as well. Okay. In it. So we just check what we've got. Well, first of all, we just check between um, live and neutral. One second. Sorry, it's a bit awkward to see here, yeah. but it, you'll see. I've got the Vita set to AC voltage. Right, okay. Symbol for DC, symbol for AC. Light shine off that. Right, so this one here is the DC sign, and this is the AC yes. sign. So we're on AC, yeah. because that's what's going into here. Yeah, and you just just check neutral and live. See, we've got no voltage there. Oh, right, second, next, keep... next to nothing. Oh, I can't really film there because it's a bit dark. But if you have a look there, and it's next to nothing. Okay, so point two of a volt. Yeah. Okay. And now what you're checking? We're now we now we check between because just in case it was ever wired up wrong, we check between the earth and the live. Right, so you've done live and neutral, and now you're doing the earth and the live. Which should still be none. That's Zero. Four volts. Yeah, it's, it's not. There could be a bit of residual voltage and stuff, and sometimes with these electronic meters, it never seem, they never seem to read a real true zero. And now check between neutral and earth as well. Okay, so it's uh, live neutral. Yeah. Live earth and earth neutral. That's it. Yeah. Okay, okay. so we're happy that that's safe. You've well. seen that, even there's nothing connected, I've still got a reading. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. So now we're going to, uh, what we're we going to do now, we're going to take try and take out this circuit board here. Yes. We now have this free, so let's get this over to the blue mat and see exactly what's going on with it. Okay, so we have it out on the uh, infamous blue mat now, and it's time, I think we're going to take this black plastic thing off. So it looks like there's just a little bit of hot glue gun on here and here, and there's just these little clips. So let's just pop off the glue gun and let's see what's under here, just in case something becomes obvious. What doesn't look great is, this was the thing with the electro thing that was off, you know, the thing that generates the spark. So 
really, unless that was a good connection, that could cause a problem. But what my brother was saying is the boiler has been working fine, and then it got to a stage where it just wasn't, you know, it'd be different if it was maybe working fine 10 times and then not once and then working fine 10 times but to be working perfectly and then just to stop working not so sure it is that because you would think unless it's been knocked which it hasn't you would think that that wouldn't be the uh, wouldn't be the case it looks like something has failed rather than a connection that isn't great but then again we don't really know do we there you go that's one off I hope I don't it's damage like a really the, uh, crude anti-tamper. Isn't it? Well, luckily we didn't damage the board there, so let's try to pop these out. It'd be nice if we could see something obvious in here. Really? Ta-da! No, can't see anything. Can't see anything obvious. Right, now we're only going by the capacitors because that's what people are saying online. But right now, looking at everything here, definitely nothing blown, definitely nothing bulging, I don't think. All looks perfect. There doesn't look to be any sort of burn marks or anything anywhere. Looks perfect. Well, there is a fuse here, just out of curiosity. We might as well go across the fuse just to see. I'm sure that's not going to be the problem. Just set this to continuity. Okay, so the fuse is okay. I'm just going to check this spark thing here. Okay, so that looks to be okay as well. So this is obviously the thing that generates the spark. Right, Paul, so did you see any pictures online that looked anything like this circuit board here? It's hard to remember. I'd have to look, I'd have to look them up. And the capacitors, there's not a huge amount of capacitors on here, is there? No, there's one three here. capacitors that apparently give the trouble. Um, I believe they're probably one, two, three from memory, but the board might be uh, different, okay. I'd have to check. Okay. What's this thing here, John? No, it's definitely, it, it, there were three, they're called axial, one axial and two, two radial case, one axial case. So does, axial, does that mean basically... That's axial. Because That's it's radial. coming out the sides. That's it, yes, like an, on an axis. Oh, okay. And they, are ra they believe they call them radial cases. I know nothing back about Oh, okay. Right. Well, maybe we should just pop them out. So it says C4, C6, and also it tells us which side is positive, doesn't it? Positive here. Apparently we've got to be really careful we keep that correct. Yeah, because it says here, so it's got positive, it's marked positive here. So the negative on these are basically the ones with the stripe on. So if you have a look here, you can, well, in fact, it's marked up with a negative symbol anyway. So we've got positive on the board here, positive here, and on this one, little positive here as well. So I'm not sure how these ones work. It must be the, the band on this side here. Well, I think... I suppose we could unsolder them, look at the values, and then see if it corresponds to the correct readings on the multimeter. And also, I have a little ESR meter somewhere as well. Maybe we can try that. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, so I'm just going to be fast forwarding it through, through this. All I'm going to be doing is unsoldering each of these. I'm going to make a note of which one goes where. So if we have a look closely, for example, this one says... Let's see if we can read the voltage on them. There you go. 63 volts, 22 microfarad. So, uh... I'm just going to check each one of them, make a note of them, unsolder them, and we can check them, see if they look, see if they're uh, faulty or not. But they, they look perfect, but then again, just because they look perfect doesn't mean they are. Right, so these are the capacitors that we're going to be changing out. I got them from CPC, I think it was next day delivery, and they're the uh, correct values. Some of them might be, are some of them higher voltage? So remember, with capacitors, it doesn't matter if they're higher voltage, as long as it's the same or higher, it will be fine, but the capacitance value has to be the same, so these are all the same. And also, these are high temperature ones as well. So these are at 100 and, 105 Celsius. They should be absolutely fine. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do them one by one. Now, out of all of them, I mean, obviously, I can't tell by looking at them. They all look to be okay. But this one doesn't look, I don't know, I'm not sure if it should look like this or not, but it just looks slightly different in there. It might be completely normal. But I think I'm going to start with this one here just to, just to see, see if it makes any difference. So I'm going to take them out one by one. So take this one out, put the new one in, and then we're going to test the old one just to see what it's testing. So I've got my temperature set at 300 degrees C. 
and I'm going to be using this little solder sucker. Right, so it tells us on the board where to put the plus two, so that's fine. Right, okay, that's not melting at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually add a bit of solder to it, and then it will make it easier to come off. There we go, so now it's all become a blob and hopefully it will come off easier. Yep. Now this next one's actually quite high up. So it looks like, I think it's this one here. There we go. There we go. Okay, so I know it sounds weird, but sometimes by adding solder to it, it actually makes it a lot easier to come off because it just helps uh, melt it all. Now, I'm not sure this is probably using unleaded solder, and by adding leaded solder to it, you're bringing the temperature down. Right, so I think what we're going to do is, let's compare the value of this to one of the ones that we're putting in. Let's see if it shows up any difference. There you go, so it's 63 volts. Now this one says 22 UM. I'm not sure because normally it's UF. So hold on. Right, okay, looking at this, unfortunately the wrong ones have been bought, but it's not going to be a major problem, because if you have a look on uh, these ones here, so basically we need 22 microfarad at 63 volts, and on these ones here, these are 22 microfarad at 63 volts, so we can just use these ones instead. Now, the 22UM was confusing me, but I googled it, and apparently it means 22 UF, but with 20, I think it was 20% tolerance, was it? 20% tolerance. 20% tolerance. So this is a new one to me, haven't seen that before. Now I was thinking that I was going to have to make this fit, but if you look closely at the board, when I took this capacitor off, I was a little bit confused because there was uh, like uh, holes underneath it, but if you look closely up here, it looks like it's designed to have both capacitors. So you can see these ones go into the top two holes and then these ones will be able to go into these holes here, making sure that the positive is this side here. So can you see it's actually a circle here, so it looks like this will fit perfectly. All we'll have to do is unsolder these two here. Now I've checked, there is, well you can tell by the, uh, the tracks that there's continuity between here and here anyway, so it shouldn't make absolutely any difference. One thing that's slightly confusing is why, you know, why put this one in instead of this one? If they're putting this one up here already, why sort of change capacity? You think it would be easier just to stick with the same format? So, not sure. If you know the answer to that, put it down in the comments because it's just a bit of curiosity, really, why they would change over to a different style of capacitor. Unless it's something to do with heat or something. So, I mean, could it just be as simple as that these are all on their side anyway and it looks nicer than the fact that they have a flat one here? Bit odd when these ones are sticking up here, but uh, I really don't know. Maybe the person that designed it did it that way so they all look the same. I haven't got a clue, but anyway, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to unsolder these two holes in the middle and then pop this one in here. And also, let's test this one now that it's out and let's see what it, uh, see what it measures. Right, so... I'm going to put the negative to this side here. Well, there you go. So that is out, isn't it? Because 20% of 22 is going to be 4.4. So that means that really it shouldn't be any less than 17. And it's at 3.5 UF. So that says to me that that particular one there is the faulty capacitor. 
be interesting to see what the others are. Maybe it's all down to do, maybe if we just change that one. Now that we've got it out, we might as well do it all. But if we just change that, we might find that it's uh, working. Now this is a, a ESR meter. Now if I'm honest with you, I haven't really got to grips with this yet, but let's plug it in and see what, uh, let's see what this thing reads. Oh, hold on, sorry. Zero it, one second. Okay, let's see what this thing reads. Right, so it says reference for a 25 volt electrolytic cap, good if capacitance is less than, that's less than, isn't it? less than 22 UF less than okay but it is 22 UF so maybe because I think this I think when capacitors can fail sometimes they can act like a resistor it's not 25 volt either it's not 25 volt okay so let's 63 no okay but let's let's go down here then so right 63 at 22 should be 1.5 so this is the worst case ESR table the worst case it should be 1.5 the worst case and it's 5.18 okay so it's well out is that right yeah i'm not really sure what esr is vince yeah in fact i don't have any idea what esr is to be honest no <laughs> uh 1.5 and then if we were to go up the voltage 1.5 25 is 2.1 is that a 63 valve capacitor though this is that's the one that's come off yeah this is 63 yeah. Yeah, because if you look, uh, let me just show the camera. There you go. 22 UM 63 volt. So that says to me, I think that this, I think that's the, I think that's the one that's failed. So let's pop a new one in, and we'll take out the other two because they they could have dried out as well, couldn't they? They could have dried out. So I yeah. suppose if one's gone faulty, maybe the other two are likely to go faulty as well. And are they the only electrolytic capacitors on that board, Vince? I think so. Okay, mate. I think so. I'm not 100% sure what this thing is here. That looks like a capacitor, does it? It is a capacitor, I would imagine, but it may not be an electrolytic one. It might yeah. be, yeah. Well, that's what it is. it called a tan tan tantalum or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Ceramic, maybe. Ceramic. Yeah. 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 But anyway, these are. The, let's change these three out. And that's what the internet said as well. So uh, yeah. that's uh, that's good that that's testing that. What's the big orange thing? I haven't got a clue. That's another massive that's capacitor, capacitor, isn't it? Yeah. 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 You have to go away, you tits it. Yeah. yeah. Things, if you didn't have the internet, we wouldn't really be a huge amount of the wiser. No. No. Yeah. No. Unless we were just... You, just, you can't just pick a component at random, you know? No, but unless we were, so for example, if you thought that caps are normally the things to but fail, which they are... You think this might be damaged, you think it, it, it doesn't look great then. Yeah, but I don't know. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, by unsoldering the caps, which are the most likely things to fail, I think, yeah. and by testing them, you can see even with the multimeter, it showed that that was faulty. Is it just the electrolytic caps that have a tendency to fail? As far as I know, yes. So these are the ones that aren't electrolytic, if they're not electrolytic? Um, I, I don't think are, so. Are less likely to be failed. So any when you've done components in the past, is it a barrel-shaped capacitor like this that has tended to be the problem? Yeah, and people always say check the caps first. Yeah, but but it's always this barrel shape, yeah, aluminium yeah. cap, the electrolytic ones. Yeah, they're aluminium as well. But right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. They're right. Okay. You've never had a problem with something that looks like that, in other words, or like that, or like that. I I personally, with the stuff that I had done, uh, no. No. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. But I did change that battleships one that I did. I did change one of the electrolytic ones yeah. into one of these type of ones. And it worked fine. So I don't know why people use these why do over we... the other ones. Yes, exactly. I don't know. It must be, yeah. Maybe because they give a much better capacitance and a smaller amount or something. Tolerances maybe or something. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Just don't know enough about it, you know? Yeah. We're going to put the plus side in this one here because it says plus here. And that's the way we took it out before. And an easy way to look is because we have the stripe here, but also the leg is shorter as well, so if you think that part is minusing a bit from here. There you go, I think that's going to look quite nice in there.
Right, what I want to do is I'm just going to put a little bit of solder in these two holes here just to fill it up. Right, let's pop out these other two while we're here as well. And again, this is 63 volts at 22 microfarad. And you can see the plus there. I'm just going to test this one, see how it's testing. Not making a good connection on it because the uh, Paul, oh, could you could you, my meter? I tell you what, Paul. If you just hold this for me, then I'll be able to do it. If you just hold that, hold that like that, make it easier. Right, which side is negative there? So that's fine. You see, 22, 21.6, and it's a 22. I reckon all the fault. I think the fault is going to be down to that one capacitor. Let's pop it on here just to see what, what it reads. So this should be reading worse, so it should be less than 1.5, shouldn't it? I that, think. That 63 volts again, is it, Vince? Yes, it's the same, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if we can get these on there without it uh, shorting out. Right, there you go, so it's 0 0.6, so it's less than 1.5, and it says there for 25 volts, good if less than 200 UF, and it is, it's 22 UF, but the figure there was 1.5 and it's 0 0.6. But we so, need 63 but volts though. You know, sure, but the 63 volts was 1.5. So we're all right. As long as it's less than, is that what matters? I think so, okay, yeah, because that's the worst case scenario. Oh, I see. So I yes. reckon that one was fine. Okay. Yeah. So let's take out the last one. Yeah. I didn't want to invest the extra 20p in the boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should have just kept the... Uh, yeah, the old the, one in there. Yeah. That's 20p that's cost me that. Huh? Might last another three months. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's pop this one out now. Now these seem to be melting okay without adding extra solder, uh, which is uh, which is odd how the first one didn't really want to come out. Does the iron take a while to heat up? I don't know, not really, no, it's up to temperature. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that one was draining more for some reason. Maybe. Double check. 
track. Yeah, that's the right one. Okay. Right, so this is 63 volts, 4.7 UF. And this is 100 volts at 4.7 UF, so that's going to be absolutely fine to use. That's them all soldered back into place, so we've got one here, where my uh, thumb is, this one here, we have got one here, which is these two ones here, and the first one we did, which I believe is the probably only the faulty one, is this one here. So let's check this last one that we just popped out, see how this one is testing. be good if it is this, because that means then that the board can be fixed for probably three capacitors, is going to be well under a pound, isn't it? You could just hold that for me, Paul, make it easier for me. There you go, 4.6 UF. So, let's put the ESR on that, but that one looks like it's working as well. So it looks like all the fault was just to do with this one capacitor here. So, so this is 63 volts at 4.7, so it should be, well this one only goes up to 10 UF here, but 63 volts at 10 UF, it should be less than 2.4, and it's 0 0.8. So, I think it might be shorting the FNC. Hold on. Yeah. There you go, 0 0.8. Yeah. So, let's just say now, so at 22 UF is 1.5, at 10 UF is 2.4. So I suppose it's going up then, so maybe it might be around at 4.7 would be roughly, the, what's the difference there, 1, so maybe 3 something, but it's well under, 0 0.8. So this one here definitely looks like it was the cause of the problems. I know I'm not used to this meter here, but that definitely looks like it was the uh, the issue. Because look, 5 ohms, that is acting more like a resistor then, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. So now what we have to do is... Put it back in the board and see if it's going to work. Here, put that back on as well. Did you want to put some glue gun on that, or do you I think see it's no going to... point to you? As long as it stays on. Yeah, let's uh, let's have a look. I think it's just anti-tamper. It does clip on well, doesn't it? Oh no, maybe, maybe not. Have you got a glue gun? No. But okay, we haven't really, we haven't got any uh, hot glue gun. I'm away from my house at the moment, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to get the heat gun on this. I'm just going to melt the glue back onto here. I'm not going to do it hot enough for the solder to melt, so I'm just going to put the heat gun at, I'm just going to do it at about 120 or so, 120C. And then that's not going to be hot enough to melt the solder, but hopefully it'll be hot enough to melt the glue just back into place. There you go, it's starting to melt already. It's all gone nice and clear now, isn't it? That's a good idea, Vince. There you go, and let's do this one here. Starting to go. It's nice that it goes clear. There we go. I'm just going to leave it like that. That's going to give it some uh, bit of grip. Just let that cool down, and it should be uh, should be done. Okay, so it's a few days later. The gas fit has been and tested it all. All testing absolutely fine, and check it out now. There you go, you can see the flames there burning away for themselves. So the problem was those capacitors are in that one capacitor on that circuit board. So what a nice little fix, rather than changing the board completely, just changing over those capacitors. In fact, just changing the one capacitor would have done the job. 
So yeah, really happy with this one, and uh, I think my brother as well. Are you happy with this? Oh, delighted to save the effort of getting a whole new board. Yeah, so it's fantastic, and uh, it just shows you how one thing, one tiny capacitor, can cause the whole thing to fail. So that's it for this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, and please subscribe for more trying to fix videos. It's bye from me, and it's bye from me. Take care. <laughs> bye now.